Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Ah, everybody full? Yes. Enjoyed your lunch? Yeah. Hallelujah. Wasn't it delicious? Yeah. Ah, let's give those that prepared that for us a hand and a thank you. Thank you. Thank you to every woman, to every one of you that prepared this beautiful setting for us that we was able to eat and enjoy and you can see everything. You know, sometimes you go someplace you can't see. The, like, what is that? <laughs> but we thank God we was able to enjoy the food and enjoy the fellowship. Amen. While we was eating bread, the natural bread, one with another. Hallelujah. So now we're going to go to the second half of the service, amen, of the conference, amen, of women of influence, hallelujah, we got a little more to give in, so I know the belly may be a little full, but you got to tell it, step aside, because the spirit got to eat some more, hallelujah, thank the Lord Jesus, the second word is purpose, and what is purpose, it's an aim, it's an intent, Intention is something set up as an object or an end to be obtained. And we all are trying to obtain the end, amen, of what this thing that God has for our lives. You know, Lord, why did you have me here on this earth? Why was I born? Okay, first I understood I had to come into a relationship with you. Now I understood that part. But what is it about me that you find beautiful? What is it about me that you want me to be able to connect with others to see your glory inside of me? What is it that the kingdom will back me up because I am in my purpose now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God have a purpose for all of us. We may not all be on the same road to that purpose. But we are all getting the same instruction from him concerning your purpose. Some got to go north. Some got to go east. Some got to go west. And some got to go south. But God will make sure you will get your purpose fulfilled. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. It's an intention. It's a resolution to something. Hallelujah. No, it ain't no big thing and little thing in God's eyes like when it comes to fulfilling your purpose. What you was created for. How well you can do it that nobody can do it like you. Ah, it doesn't matter if you may even see a copycat of it. It ain't going to be like yours. Hallelujah. And it's a determination. Hallelujah. We got to be determined. To see our purpose fulfilled in this earth realm. Which means you can't give the enemy a foothold. Hallelujah. To prevent you fulfilling your purpose on earth. And you can't throw in or give in before your time. No matter how hard it may get in this life. Because you know we all done uh, 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 had our struggles. And we all done had our hardship. And we done had some things that set us back a little bit. But God sprung us forth again. Hallelujah. So that's the determination we must keep. Amen. We must not uh, uh, cast our hope aside. Hallelujah. Because there's a purpose for our lives. Hallelujah. And God wants him, God wants us to allow him to fulfill that purpose in us. Hallelujah. Some will be together with other people and some purpose you have to just do alone. Because of what it's called for. Some of us will have to carry it alone. Because of what it is in detail of. So, you know, you have to get those instructions from the Lord. You can't share your purpose with everybody. Everybody ain't got your, your vision and your dream. No. They can right. smile in your face, but that don't mean they know. Amen. And have your best interest in mind. Amen. 
Amen. So be mindful of that when God is setting you up for your purpose. Know whom God wants to connect you to for that purpose. Amen. Because remember, we got an adversary that comes to do what? Steal. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. If he can steal it, then he already can do the other two. Kill it and destroy it. Because you're going to feel the, the bump of it because you thought that person had your best interest in mind to share that purpose with. God will tell you who to share the purpose with. That is sacred. That's the sacred part of our walk. Jesus didn't and tell the, the 12 disciples with everything. There was a time he had to only pull three to the side and share some sacred things with them three. He couldn't include all 12 of the disciples with that information, especially when they went to the transfiguration. All 12 disciples was not there. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give them some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We now have our next speaker. Hallelujah. She's ready. Yeah, she's ready. Ah, Jesus. She is ready. Our next speaker will be our very own Pastor Amy. Hallelujah. The visionary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our visionary, the one God has given the vision to, to, you know, start stepping out in faith and, and do those things that she thought not that she can do. Hallelujah. And God done gave her a back-to-back -back move. Hey, God gave her a back-to-back -back move. Hallelujah. I don't care if it was just one person that showed up. God needed her to move. Hey, it's not so much on who's all coming. It's about I need you to move. I need to, I need you to know that this is what I called you to do. This is how I want you to start off. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Start releasing some of them gems that have been built up in her for a long time. Amen. Yeah, because she got some revelations to share. Amen. Hallelujah. Besides being a beautiful wife to the pastor and a mother. Amen. Now it's time to be the worker of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. So she's stepping out, y'all. And that ain't an easy thing to do when God begin to call you. Amen. Hey, it sounds good when you get that word. But when God begin to say, come on, let's do this. Oh, honey, you want to back up now. But God said, I can't let you back up because there's others to be reached. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But right before we bring our word, amen, we're going to bring up Minister Amy Arnold. and Annabelle. Arnold. Okay, well, I apologize. <laughs> Arnie. Arnie. Okay, okay. We're going to bring up our very own sister. She's coming with a poem. Amen. Let's welcome her. Amen. And then the next voice you hear is Pastor Amy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Amy. <laughs> The Lord was drawing me to himself, even as a little girl. I desperately needed to know the Lord. And um, it was a time I was about eight years old, and I just cleaned my bedroom, which is a, was a big accomplishment for me back then. <laughs> and I got out my little red folding chair and set it out, and I thought, now I'm going to pray. And I, all I knew was the Lord's Prayer, uh, and I had it in a big, uh, one of the golden books, you know, of the Lord's Prayer. So I, I read that, and then I, I sang Jesus Loved Me. I only knew a couple songs. <laughs> and then I, I started to get words, little bits of words that rhymed. I thought, poetry. And then I started to get um, tunes and but it was like it was sort of like they were floating around in the air, and I, I couldn't capture them. It was I thought felt like this was too hard. This was too beyond me. I. But then I prayed. I said, Lord, someday 
I'd like you to give me poems. And someday, I'd like you to give me tunes and songs. So the years went by, and and um, I, I was a, a, I had been an art major, and a, I was going to be an art teacher, and that dream fell to the ground and died, and it was a big wound in me, and <laughs> which the Lord did later heal. But when I was 30, in my early 30s, I started getting poems. They just started like falling in my lap. And then in my 40s, early 40s, I started reading songs. And I said, I said, Lord, you know, I've been trying all this time to do something in the visual arts, and I feel like I'm hitting a brick wall. But now I, I'm getting these poems and songs, and I didn't ask for them. He said, yes, you did. He said, I did. And then he brought back the memory of this little girl in a little red folding chair asking Lord for poems and songs. So, Praise the Lord, he hears the prayers of children. Yeah. Oh, and then he even put it in my little my heart to pray for those things. He loves us that much that that um, he does give us the desires of our hearts in more ways than one. Outrageous love. What outrageous love that the Father sent his son. That in the universe so wide, so vast, so high, God picks out a soul to call his own. God who sits on his lofty throne in a place where no lack or hunger be cares for such little ones as you and me. He, ruler of planets and stars, gives in exchange his life for hours, coming in form as a humble man, he puts on the film of human skin. He enters this contaminated realm, overwrought with the pangs of sin. Can earthly beings fathom the depth of love divine? Can human flesh imagine what influenced God's mind that he should take such treatment. Was there ever a love like this? The forest trees are whispering its wonder. The elements stand in awe. The angels turn the pages to read the story of the ages. Oh, I need to turn the page. <laughs> it is love divine expressed in the far and wide of the, the universe expanse a heavenly romance come to woo the children of men come to mend our broken hearts come to heal the sick and soul come to make the wounded whole yes. sing trees sing rocks sing stars sing all people near and far the father calls us his own and now we belong to him. We run to him, hide in him, and find in him our home. Wow. Amen. Wow. That was beautiful, wasn't it? I had tears in my eyes. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Glory to God. <laughs> He loves us so much. Mm. Do me a favor, grab your Bible and stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Now I need you to put those verses up there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Please turn, turn with me to Acts chapter 13, verse 22.
Now while you're finding this, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm transformed. I'm transformed. Thank you, Jesus. Annabelle's there. She's ready. I mean, she's ready. Come on. Okay, now here's the purpose. Because God never does anything without a purpose. In verse 22 it says, and when he had removed him, speaking of Saul, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all of my will. Now look at your neighbor. Call their name out and say, Amy, when God removed Saul, he raised him up, David, who he gave testimony, a man after his own heart, which shall, not might, not might, but will, but will fulfill all the will of the Lord. All the will of the Lord. Now say, Amy. Now, there's a reason. There's a reason. You've been transformed. You've been transformed. God. Now look at him and say, God removed him. God removed him. See. God doesn't leave things and keep things around that dwell in the flesh. God doesn't keep man around with his own agenda that has his own agenda. But he raised him up, David, to be their king to who he gave this testimony that he found in him a man after God's own heart who will do all the will of the Lord. Now my question to you, look at your neighbor one more time. <laughs> say my okay, look at him, say Amy. Lord, are you are you going to do going to do all the will of the Lord? All the will of the Lord. Are you are you in this all the way? In this all the way. Are you fully committed? Are you fully committed? Are you really ready for transma transformation? Are you really ready for transformation? Are you are you going to do going to do all the will of the Lord? All the will of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay, I know that. I know you want blessing, but my question to you is, okay, not that you want blessing, but are you going to do the will of the Lord? All right. Okay. I'm just looking for someone who knows they've been transformed to do everything that God has determined, everything that God has decreed. You aren't transformed just so you can move into a house or drive a nice car or get yourself some cute guy. You've been transformed so that you can bring forth the glory of God and be an image bearer in the earth. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I've been transformed. I've been transformed. Now you may have been seated. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes. God. Listen, God. Not a man, not a pastor. Raised up a man after his own heart. Okay? Now the word raised there in the Greek means to awaken. God awakened. He released. He caused something to come forth in David. Now, I want to talk to sons and daughters. 
I'm not here for everyone, but I am speaking prophetically to someone. Okay? God is awakening you. There is something stirring on the inside of you. You don't even know why, quite why you came. But you knew that you had to get here. Even if you had to borrow some money or get a, a, a way here, someone, a, a, a cop arise, you had to get here. You knew that God has something for you today. Because listen, God's awakening. He's calling you for his purpose. There's a deeper hunger that it cannot be church as usual. All right? It can't be the same old, same old. There's something in you. There's more to life than what I've been living. And God is awakening something. You've been through a process, which is a series of inevitable events that lead to your determined end. Because God does have a determined end. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts or the plans that I have for you to give you an expected end. And the word declares whom he gave testimony, which means to testify, Amen. to witness. Amen. To testify is to make a declaration of the truth, mm. okay, or a fact. You see, when God declares truth and a fact over you, now listen, stay with me, there is, when he says these things, okay, you see, other people, it, it might not be what they say about you, mm -hmm. all right? But when God makes the declaration, whatever God declares over you, no man can stand against it. Amen. Did you hear me? No man can stand against it. What God declares over your life, no man can stand against it. Man cannot stand against what God has determined over you. That's why you can. they can never disqualify your destiny. You're the only one who can walk away and disqualify your destiny. But somebody endured All right. and stood firm under pressure. You went through some different things, okay, that brought you to a point for such a time as this. So here's the emphasis. That God testifies that this is my man. He's talking about David. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's going to bring forth the evidence of uh, that he's determined over your life. He's the one that is giving witness to who has called you. God makes this testimony and he says, here's the real emphasis, because David ultimately will do all the will of the Lord. Now when he says that, the will means the determined or choice, specifically the purpose or decree. And he will make or he will do. So in other words, I am awakening my sons and daughters which will do every, every purpose, every determination, every decree of mine, God is causing sons and daughters to come forth. Amen. That will do. Not shall, might, mm -hmm. but will do. Mm -hmm. Now many of you know that God's ways are not, how many know that God's ways are not man's ways? Mm -hmm. All right, let me see. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Because God's stirring up things for those whose lives have been called, all right, to embrace him with the same intensity that he's embraced you. Their call is to his greatness. I know I'm speaking to the world changers and history makers in here. <laughs> to usher in a new expression of order. Change has already happened. I declare that. I declare, decree that over your life. 
It's already happened. The shift has already taken place. No means different from one state or one of the same that existed before. Something of quality that has advanced to a better quality. Matthew 9, 17. <laughs> it says, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. All right? Mm -hmm. Now that's the Amplified Bible. God says there's a new thing that has been released in the earth. And they are called to bring forth reformation. What, and what is reformation? It's a structurally adjustment where we bring back the original. We bring change in the earth. And we bring a revolution. Revolution is when we begin to overthrow and we begin to change things. All right? How, how many people want to see York change? Let me, let me see your hands. Come on. We need to bring forth a revolution to change York and to get it out of its stinking thinking. Because God wants to make a real difference. He doesn't just want to play church. He wants to make a difference in the marketplace. He wants to bring a, uh, in every nation. He wants to make a difference in every home, every tribe, every tongue. But you cannot bring what you don't possess. How can you bring change if you haven't been changed? I'm here for somebody who's transformed. Amen? So God brought change ultimately to bring change. Okay? He brought it in me to bring it out of me. Okay? So he can use through me. There's a transformation that took place. Can I talk to some people that went through a process? Because it's a process. There is a predetermined end, a uh, predetermination in God. It's going to cause that realization of the good, perfect, acceptable will of the Lord in all of us. When you're transformed, there's a mark changed in your appearance, your form, your function, your character, your nature. God is working all things for your good, for those who are that are called. Transformation means even though I kind of look the same on the outside from five years ago, hey, hey you got a whole different That's person. Right. Yes. Because there's no fear now. Okay? There's no care about man's opinion. All I want is God's glory and the glory of God. I'm hungry for God. I'm desperate for God. God, I need you. You've been stripped and pressed down enough. Enough. Come on. The, the thing is, we have to go through. Sometimes you've been through hell. All right? Have you gone through enough hell in your life that you, you don't, you don't want to look cute? It's not about looking cute anymore. You're all about is his glory with me. Now I'm here for somebody. Say transformation. Transformation. Trans means across, beyond, through, to change. Formation is the act or process of forming. And it comes from the word form, which means appearance, shape, and image. A pattern or a design. So a transformation is changing thoroughly the process of forming. Now stay with me here. Okay? Because we can't transform ourselves. All we can do is yield, like the song said, yield to the process. God is the transformer. I can only yield to the process. I can resist it or I can flow with it. 
The more you try to make things happen, and let me tell you, that is such a frustration. Because when you when you're frustrated, you know you're trying to make things. You're trying to make something happen. You're trying to force it into a place that it has no place being in. Jesus. <laughs> you know, you can't make them accept you, and you can't make them be kind to you. That's right. All right. You can't make them pay back to you. And the more you try to force, the more resistance there's going to be. And God just says, flow with it. If you flow with the process that God's taking you through of transformation, you'll find a rhythm of life that you didn't even know that you had. Okay? Because you're bigger than you've been before. There's more on the inside of you that God's developing and releasing out of you. There's greatness in you that God is going to use to break forth generational curses. And believe me, I know what I'm talking about. There's greatness in you. It will break every curse in your generation and your families. And there's greatness that God's going to use to win your city to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's greatness that God's going to use to fund the kingdom through that business. Listen, he's talking to somebody in here. He's going to birth out of you. I don't know here who I'm here for, but somebody who's going through a transformation. Look at your neighbor. Say, flow with it. Flow with it. Just flow with it. Amen? <laughs> and so transformation is changing thoroughly through the process of forming. Genesis 2-7. It declares... The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Formed means through the squeezing and to shape and to mold and to form, fashion and frame. It's from the root word of Pressing to be narrow. Now, who formed man? God. Come on. God did. Mm -hmm. So God presses mm -hmm. to make things narrow. Mm. It means to stress and to vex. See, God's ways aren't man's ways. So when God forms, he begins to press and he squeezes mm -hmm. to be narrow. That's the same word as in the Hebrew as trouble. He squeezes you into a place of trouble. Kristen knows what I'm talking about. You've got two mountains on the side of you. The Red Sea in front of you and Pharaoh and his army behind you. And basically you're boxed in. So you have nowhere to go but to God. All right, okay. All right. See, trouble when you get in a tight place. Has anybody ever been in a tight place? Yes. All right. Somebody got in a tight place with their money. Got in a tight place in your life. Got in a tight place when things started getting restricted. And you didn't have the friends. And you didn't have the network. And you didn't have the network. And you didn't have the influence. Uh -huh. You couldn't reach to the, all the things that you could reach to before. But now, all you can do is throw your hands up and reach to him. All, right, Jesus. all you can do is say, God, if you don't help me, there is no help for me. All right. And what you think is a bad place is going to be the best place. Come on. Look to your neighbor and say, flow with it. Yes, God. Yes, God. Because trouble becomes.
becomes your indicator or your signal that you're in transition or transformation. Amen. So when you get in trouble, it's the signal and the indicator that you are transforming. God is pressing something. Now I want to talk to someone who's going through some trouble in the last five years. I want to see if I'm in the right place here. Did anyone here go through any trouble? Okay. Did anyone lose their house? Did anyone almost lose their mind? Did anybody else lose their family? Did anybody lose someone they love? Did anybody lose someone that they thought would be a part of their life the rest of their life? Did anybody else have somebody talk about them, hurt them, walk out on them, break their heart? Did anyone have something that you didn't expect? Did anybody get a disease that you didn't think would be your death sentence? The devil is a liar. Did anyone get a disease that you didn't think? Listen, he says, God is a God of all things possible. Amen? Amen. And when we look to him, Satan is nothing but a stinking liar. Amen. All he did, like she said, what did he do? Still? That's right. So has anybody ever gone through some tight places and some narrow? Yes. Come on. And I know you're serving God and you're tithing and you're worshiping and you're in trouble. Yes. I understand the heathen and the sinner getting in trouble. I mean, I don't mean to understand it, uh, but I understand it. But what about the blood-bought Holy Spirit, tongue-tucking, washed in His blood, sanctified? I'm talking about set apart, justified, called by God, chosen, and you're in trouble! to show off who he is because he's God. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In order that he may fulfill, say fulfill, fulfill. All, the will. all the will. Say all the will as David did. All the will as David did. Yes. And then some. <laughs> yes. Now can I talk about this process? Amen. All right. Because David becomes a pattern. <clears throat> Excuse me. He becomes a pattern. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Abraham was the pattern of posterity. Mm -hmm. David is the pattern for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. The kingdom is thy will be done. Now stay with me. Because David is an interesting and fascinating man. I find him fascinating. He's the eighth son of Jesse. Mm -hmm. He's not really appreciated or liked by his brothers. And he's not preferred by his father. Mm -hmm. Okay. Psalm 51, 5. It says, Where he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Some theologians, that's, now who are we talking about here? Okay? Some theologians believe that he was a bastard child. He had so many psychological complexities that divulge into these uh, his dysfunctions and his issues. Mm -hmm. Now I know that there's nobody in here that has dysfunctions or any issues, right? What? Look at your neighbor and say, that's the other church. <laughs> <laughs> but just in case, just in case, say just in case. Just in case. Just in case. He's fascinating, okay? Because we read about it and these complexities and these difficulties and these dysfunctions that continue to plague his life. For starters, his family is all jacked up. Okay, so let's not look for somebody whose family is not all jacked up because it doesn't exist. All right, that little white picket fence family. That doesn't exist. Leave it to Beaver never did exist. Listen, Wally was on drugs, guys. <laughs> they lied to us. And we bought the lie. The devil is a liar. All right. Amen. And so his family's all what jacked up. <laughs> You'll find in 2 Samuel, his son Amden rapes his daughter Tamar. Now here's a little bit of history, okay? Real, real quick. Absalom, his other son, kills Amden, and then David refuses to talk to Absalom. And you know why David doesn't talk to him? It's because his daddy never talked to him. Yes, you're good. So we keep repeating these cycles. You know, and, and because his daddy didn't talk to him, you know, his son and, and now Absalom tries to divide the kingdom and take it from him. And he's all messed up with all his children. And if that's not bad enough, think about his relationship with his first wife. Okay, here we go. He loved, and now I'm going to say Michael because I've heard it pronounced that way. Pastor Howard says it's Michal. But there's other people that say Michael, so I'm going to say Michael. It's easier for me. I mean, Michael, not just a prize, but Saul's daughter, okay, that's Saul's daughter. But the Bible says that he's going to forfeit the kingdom, okay? So when he's getting ready to take the kingdom, he's going to forfeit it because he loves this woman so much. So when he brings back the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God, all right, she's standing on the outside. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got something to tell you about standing on the outside, mm. okay? And so when he brings it back with this presence, she's standing on the outside. She's sitting on the outside. And that's the whole nother message right there. But because what you're doing, sitting back while everyone else is in it. Whenever somebody else is, starts sitting out and they always point to you like you're the problem. You're not the problem. Because anytime you're standing on the outside and you don't put yourself on the inside, when all of Israel, which represents this, uh, the body of Christ, 
is blessing God and problems, not the church, the problem is you. Okay, because you're the body of Christ. You're the one, listen, you're the one standing back saying, aren't you cute? You're the one there with the critical attitude. Strip yourself of that nasty attitude. Strip yourself of that kind of self-righteousness. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor and say, she's talking about that other church again. <laughs> Down there. So Michael's sitting there with an attitude, okay? She's saying, aren't you cute? You dance before the little girls of all Israel. And David, he gets mad, okay? Because one thing you don't touch, one thing you never touch in a person's life, And there were a lot of things. Man, my heart was broken and people can make me feel bad and try to give me a complex. Try to make me feel like I was a product of what I was going through. But the one thing if you ever touch, and thank God that most people that, that really wanted to take me out touched it. Because the one thing you don't ever touch, I'm going to bow up against you. I'm going to bow up against you because you can't touch my relationship with God. All right. You can't touch who I am with him. Because this is the one thing I know for sure. I know he has made me. I know who I am in him. I don't know a whole lot about that, about uh, one thing and, and from this thing but I know you can't tell me that my God doesn't love me all right all right you can't tell me my God's not for me you can't tell me my God hasn't called me you can't tell me my God doesn't have a covenant with me because he brought me too far Right. He's taught me too much. He's shown me his goodness, his glory, his grace, his mercy. I've come too far for that kind of nonsense. All right. Go use it on somebody else. Look at your neighbor and say, that stuff don't work on me anymore. Don't work no more. It don't work. And so she tries to touch his anointing. You can't touch a person's anointing. Mm -hmm. She says, aren't you cute? They're dancing before the Lord. And he says, you think that was something? I'll dance even more. I'll dance even harder. I'll give more. And I'll praise louder. You think that was something? Watch what I'm about to do for God. If that offended you, this isn't about you. I, you didn't save me, girl. You didn't get me out of this. You didn't pull me out. You didn't anoint me. You didn't choose me. You didn't get me out of my out the streets. You didn't feed me when I had didn't have no food and didn't give me no peace when I was gonna lose my mind. You didn't do it. You didn't put me pull me out from my feet upon the solid rock. Baby, this ain't about you. I will bless the Lord.
So after Michael touches the anointing, he never has intimacy with her again. Mm -hmm. Hmm. He returns with that ark. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> so you know all the stories, all the stuff about with women. David, he's David is just fascinating. Okay, I mean then then he's with Bathsheba. Now that sounds not like not too bad, right? I mean it's bad, but he's he's with Bathsheba. But the thing that's all mind boggling is listen who she is the daughter of. I'm getting ready to tell you. Ahithophel. That's his name. A granddaughter. Okay? So David watches Ahithophel. Listen, he's the counsel of God. He's the oracle. And forbidden. Listen, forbidden is forbidden. But then there's forbidden. Okay? Yes, Lord. Like, hello? David, what are you thinking? And he touches Bathsheba. And y'all know that story. And, and if that's not bad enough, you know the women problem goes all the way to the end of his life. Oh, my. Listen, they're throwing a virgin in his bed to see if he's still alive. Let's get real. Let's talk Bible now. Oh, Jesus. So David's dealing with all this yet, but yet uh, he, he's going to do all the will of the Lord. He, he, look at your neighbor say, God is dealing with us. God is dealing with us. us but, but he's transforming. But he's transforming us. Okay. Now that's not acceptable behavior because you better believe that David had restitution for every wrong decision in his life. That's right. Listen, there's restitution for everything that we move outside of the covenant of God. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you something here that's going to make take you to a new level. Because his male relationships aren't that healthy either. Mm -hmm. All right? And not, and, and not that discerning. He runs into the arms of Saul that the Bible says he loved greatly. Jonathan and David, the Bible says their souls were knit together. There's really not one healthy relationship in his life. Uh, he's a man of war. He can't build the temple because he has bloody hands. He's too violent. And he's so violent, but yet he's so sensitive. I mean, he's a musician. I mean, he can just pull out that harp and demons begin to depart from the saw. They begin to flee. I mean, this man, so he's got to be moody. Come on. I mean, he's fighting and playing a harp. He's complex. He's complicated. And yet with all his dysfunctions, watch. Watch what it says. He's a man after God on his heart. Can't touch that. Can't touch it. Have you ever been in a position, it's not that you don't want to be transformed. You really do. I mean, have you ever been in a position and, and you really wanted to be changed and every day you're being changed a little bit more than you were yesterday. Thank God for it. And every day, you don't know how far you had to come. See, that's why I, I, don't, I don't judge people. Because I don't know how far you had to come to get to where you are today. So if I don't think there's progress in your life, and I haven't looked at you where you, I haven't looked at where you've come from, so maybe there's still a long way to go. But I just want to see, did they take another step today? Did they change into his image a little bit more? Do they look like God, act like God, walk like God, talk like God, think like God? 
and every day begin to express more like who God is. Because watch this, no one wakes up polished. All right. Look at your neighbor, say, leave me alone. <laughs> I'm being developed. <laughs> leave me alone. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Yes, Lord. It's that other church. <laughs> now, this is not an excuse for sin. It's not. Because I'm not I'm not I'm not talking about missing the mark. I'm talking about being processed into the image of God. Okay, so they go through a process that develops them. <clears throat> and in the process of being God's man who will bring forth the plan that's determined to come to pass, God allows David's personal situations to be displayed. It's one thing to go through it. It's another thing for everybody to see it. Now, do I have anybody in the house that's gone through anything publicly? 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. Second Corinthians 3.3 3 says, For as much as we, as ye manifestly declared to the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You are living epistles. Our lives are the paper that God wants to write on. So God doesn't just write for the sake of journaling, but to send his sermon into the world. You become the word that God wants to preach. Did you hear me? You become the word. So God's saying, I'm going to let them see you go through all these struggles. I'm going to let them see. Now here's the good news. The Bible tells me, I think, that David had enough of God that he wasn't messing up in the end. So his mistakes that he made in the beginning, I don't think he was making the same mistakes that he did in, in the end. Because I believe there was a transformation that took him to a higher level, that when he, that he made better decisions. I don't believe he was doing the same silly, stupid things that he did in the beginning. So you become the word. But people have seen. And the problem with people is they try to hold you to where you've been instead of taking you to where you're going. They try to hold you back to your mistakes and your failures or your past. Look to your neighbor and say, I've been transformed. I've been transformed. You don't know what I've gone through. <laughs> Let me go. I've been transformed. I'm being transformed. And so watch. You become the word that he wants to preach or proclaim. So God allows you to be transformed right before people's eyes. God allows you to go from timidness and shyness to boldness and authority. God allows you to go from indecisiveness and loose living to decision and to have convictions. Yes, God. To live on principles. To live firm. They don't believe it. They just want, just because you were a loose goose years ago, all right, they don't think that you can stand solid today. But you can stand solid today because you've been transformed. Because you're a different person. You may look a little bit different than you did a couple years ago on the outside, but ultimately you're different in your form and your function. 
Right. So most of the sermons are going to be born out of furnaces of affliction. Mm -hmm. People are going to watch you go through it. Yes, God. Why? Because the Bible has to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. All right, get this one. Look at your neighbor. Okay. <laughs> Tell them you're a prophecy. You're a prophecy. <laughs> you are a lot. You are a prophecy. <laughs> so David had this threefold anointing. I'm going to take you somewhere and then I'm going to close up. All right. He had this threefold anointing. Number one, he's going to be anointed in the midst of his brethren. Mm -hmm. Two, over Judah. Mm -hmm. Three, over Israel. Mm -hmm. All right. So God will take him on a process of transform transformation. I'm going to teach you that process real quick because there's three dimensions. There are three different Hebrew words and the Greek words to anointing. All pictured and paralleled in the life of David. The anointing is more than a feeling. Now if I lay my hands on you for this anointing, you can't get something simply because I've gone through it. Okay? I can lay my hands on you and give you impartation. You can't be something that is not it that is released into your life that you haven't paid a price for. All right. All right. You have to go through something. There's three different levels of anointing. So when you experience this kind of presence of God, let me take you through a place and a process, and you're going to understand the anointing is much more than a feeling or an idea or an atmosphere. It's knowing and assurance that God is with us. And so there's three dimensions, three levels. Somebody take me. Uh, some, somebody say, take me to this level. Now, I want to go to the highest place and go. Right. I want to go to the highest place. All right. <clears throat> I want to go where the, where the giraffe is. I want to go to the high place. Come on. Because we want this anointing. We don't want to just feel goosebumps in the sanctuary. We, wanna, we don't want to just have a conference to see something. Okay? I want to be changed so I can walk. Wherever I walk and I go, there is transformation. When I bring the change, then I become. When I bring the change, then I become. I want to see that wherever I go, okay? There is life in Christ, and I create things, and I call those things that are not as though they are. Sickness has to go. I have authority over cancer and epilepsy and disease and death. It does not rule in the name of Jesus. And poverty is broken because I'm the head and not the tail. And I don't struggle with paying my bills or lose sleep over how I'm going to get it. Because I know that God is my supplier. And if he's got to send ravens in, he'll send them in. Bring whatever he needs. Amen. So God says, watch. There's a process that you're going through. Okay? You're going to start on the outer court and go into the inner court. But you're going to land up in the Holy of Holies. Is there anybody who wants the fullness of the anointing? Amen. The fullness of the anointing. Is there anybody who wants to look like God, act like God, talk like God, think like God, walk like God, create like God? I think different. I look different. I function different. My shape is different. I resemble and I reflect the glory of the living God. I'm going to take you to the deepest level. So you've got to understand the level of three. Listen, God's purposes are always revealed in Scripture by three. I'm throwing that out to you. All right? Proverbs 22, 20. 
Have I not written to you excellent things? Which means, okay, listen, a triple thing, a triangle thing, a threefold measure in counsels and knowledge. Have I not given you a triangle or trifold or triple thing? These excellent threefold things signify not only are there three levels so that one is preferred above another, but also three parts are required to make a whole or to complete. So everything threefold. There are people who just want to live on the outer court because they want everybody else to do the work. We're, we're out of the days of man's labor trying to get you into a place of holiness and getting you into a place of being transformed. You're not going to kill me to make you look like God, act like God, talk like God, walk like God, create like God. Because the same price that is paid to go into that place, we are now New Testament believers, which means we are the priests. We've been raised up to go into that place and to prevail into his presence and to press into that holy place. Each dimension of the anointing reveals ever-increasing levels of divine power of God's word. So the day of restoration is here. When we talk about the day of restoration in biblical, if in biblical terms, what it means is that literally you're back again. Say, I'm back again. I'm back again. That's the etymology. Now, that God is bringing back to the garden. God is bringing back that his original intention and his final decision. That what God said in the beginning, subdue, have authority, he, he, uh, uh, dominion, you're going to rule. God's original intention is his final decision. So like David, you had to go through a process. Help me, Joseph. Help me, Zion. Help me, children of the Most High God. Help me to those that are called into the Holy of Holies. Help me to those that want to experience release. Help me to those who are tired of playing church and you want to be the church, which is the spotless bride. Help me that you know your sons and daughters and that you are sons and daughters are glory according to the book of Hebrews. You've been a process because there's been a trifold process that had to take place. Everything that comes into maturity comes into trifold. Jesus was dedicated in the temple. He's baptized in the River Jordan. He's crucified on the cross. Everything's trifold. David represents the pattern of the kingdom. The first thing he's anointed in the midst of his brethren. Samuel. First Samuel 16:13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The first anointing, this is so important, is to smear Okay? Don't miss me. It's to smear over or to pour oil. Samuel goes down to Bethlehem to see to Jesse's house. And when he goes to pour the oil on the head, there's seven sons. Now listen, that oil is not going to flow until it gets on the right head. That's why you don't ever have to worry about God and that he's going to pour that on somebody else. Uh-uh. Your life is not going to be poured on to someone else. You don't have to worry about to fight your, for your anointing. What God has for you 
it is for you. And he's got oil to be poured on your head. He's got oil to be poured down you. He's got oil that is going to saturate you. And that oil won't flow on the wrong head. Samuel asked the question when the flask was not released, when it was not dispensed. He said, is there another? Yep. Yes, but he's not on the inside. He's on the outside. Wait a minute, he's on the outside? I don't get that. See, you better hear this. Because some of you people that did, there's been people that have discounted you. Because they don't think you're in. They don't think you're ministry material. They don't think you're qualified. They don't think that you've got what it takes to be in that position to experience his anointed. David gets overlooked, but his father says, go fetch him. Do whatever you have to do in order to bring him in. What you think is his fault or failure, God says, get it in my house so I can pour some oil on it. What you think is finished with and won't be used by God, God says, bring it in up under this anointing and get it up under here because I'm about to pour some oil on it. And when God starts pouring, pouring his oil, that's just the invitation that they come to a recognition that there is more to life than what I've been living. There's a greater glory. And I'm not there, but I sure want it. And that's where they start getting hungry. Because what you see is vacillation. God sees as process of maturation. Because God wants somebody to become. He doesn't want somebody who thinks they already are. God's looking for a man who's pliable. I'm looking for somebody that I can take and mold and form and shape. I'm looking for somebody who's not so set in the way that they think, okay, that they're, they're, they're going to do. They think they've got it all figured out. I'm looking, at, I'm looking for somebody, if, if I say stand in reverence, you stand in reverence. If you're going to fall, then fall on the ground. Yell, yell, shout, shout, run, run, whatever it is, God. Whatever it is, wherever you're moving, wherever the wind is blowing, Lord God, it is holiness. It's on my face. It's yeah. running down. And if it's shouting, if it's serving, if it's giving, whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do. I'm pliable. I'm usable. I'm moldable. I'm not saying that you can only do it this way. I'm saying do it your way, Lord. From whatever you have to do to form me. Remove things that you have to remove. Put in what you got to put in. Take out what you got to take out. Change me. Transform me. Mend me. Break me. Bend me. Do whatever needs to be done. It's all about you. So what you see as vacillation, God sees as maturation. Someone who's pliable. So he anoints him and he pours in the presence of God and his brethren. Now what you gave up on, he says to him, is what I'm about to use. So you better hear the word of the Lord. So the first anointing is the beginning of your journey. It initiates the lion, the bear and the lion. Okay? It causes him to come before Goliath and kill him. This is where you learn spiritual warfare. When you walk in that first dimension of anointing, it leads you into uncharted territory. You are living your nice little Presbyterian life. And if you're working your nine to five, making your paycheck, everything's just nice and perfect and put together. And then, then you get poured on. <laughs> and 
when you got poured on, all hell started breaking loose. Yes. Well, I thought heaven was going to happen. Yeah. That's not a pattern. Because the first thing that happens when you start getting poured, in, poured on is you find you can defeat a bear. Then once you find out you can defeat a bear privately, you find out you can defeat a lion privately. And when you get up and you find your Goliath, and when you defeat, you can defeat Goliath. And when you defeat an army, you think, uh, you fools, aren't you doing nothing about it? You're going to sit back and let them talk to us like that? I don't think so. No, 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 no. Who you are, you uncircumcised giant to defy the army of the living God, I'm ready. Let me take you on. Let me take him on. And his brothers are mocking him and, and the whole thing. We know uh, the naughtiness of your heart. He, they said, uh, we know that you're going to go, you're, 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 doing, you're going down there, but you aren't going to come back. Just go home. Go home to daddy, boy. That's what they said. Go back. You aren't even supposed to be down here. And he's got this slingshot. And he does his thing. Because he's anointed. He's been poured on. Because those levels that you're going through, okay, because you're learning discipline. That's the place where you're learning through trials and tribulation. You're learning to how to walk through wilderness experience. It's the placing of training you. It's that place that God is taking you because Goliath is not your real enemy. If you're fighting Goliath, you're still on a first level anointing. Because anything that is easy is not your real enemy. And Goliath is going to die easy. In fact, he's going to die so easy, you're going to take that sword and cut his head off. And the reason you cut it off is because it represents government. That's why you chop off the heads of an enemy. It represents God's government. If you get them anywhere else from beneath them, then you don't make a change. You kill that thing and you take its head to understand through discipline and through training that you have authority over every generational curse. You do. I've been trained for this stuff. I know how to break up oppression and suicide through the blood of Jesus. I know how to lift you up out of that stuff in the name of Jesus. That's training. What you're going through is training and discipline. But if you stay there, you're staying on a first level anointing. Which is why you keep running back to get poured on. And you killing us preachers because you keep running back. <laughs> Pour some more oil on me. Pour some more oil on me. <laughs> well, Jesus. You got to go to the second and third level. Listen, is anybody in this, ready, this place ready to go? Up higher? Up higher to the next level? <laughs> Because David's second level anointing means smeared on. I know I said smeared on on the first one. It was poured on. The second one is smeared on. So there's a difference between being poured on and smeared on. See, when you start smearing, the Bible says that it was smeared on by the tribe of Judah and Hebron. Good boy. Second Samuel. Chapter 2, verse 4. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that 
the men of Jebu how do you say it? Say it again. Gilead. Jabeshid Gilead. Were they that buried Saul? Okay, thank you. The second level and dimension of anointing means to rub on with oil. So it's to paint or it means to consecrate. When the oil was smeared on, it lasted a little longer than when it was poured on. Okay? So when it's poured on, you need to keep running back and getting a fresh. But when it's smeared on, it lasts a little bit longer there. And the second anointing, now watch how it gets smeared on, was smeared on in, the Judah, in Judah at Hebron. Judah means praise. The Hebron means one who has crossed over or the place of communion. Because when you cross over, the place of communion is a place of being joined together with Christ. You cross from life, death to life. You've crossed over the Jordan. You've crossed over to a new beginning. You've crossed over to that place where you have oneness and union and fellowship. And then there's a place of praise because it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. What matters is what's going on on the inside because you get rubbed on with an anointing. And it's more than just a pouring on, but it's a rubbing on the inside of you. So David begins to reign here as king. And his administration is limited to Judah, but this is where he crosses over and he begins to reign and praise. Because the second level anointing is when I begin to reign by the praise that's inside of me. Listen, I don't need music. I don't need church. I don't need another saint. I don't need that place to get me to the second level. Now there's another level. Listen, but I don't need somebody pumping me up. And I don't need somebody prophesying over me. I don't need somebody to tell me something I already know because the Lord already told me to bless him at all times. So you begin to understand that my praise was my payoff. I'm commanded not to bless him for all things, but to bless him in all things. So I always praise. I wake up in the morning and I praise him. I go to bed at night and I praise him. I praise him on the mountaintop and I praise him in the valley. I found out something about praise. Judah is always sent first. He always goes first. It's where you learn to praise first. It's about praise. Because if you're praising after, then you still have a pouring on anointing. But when you've got a rubbing on anointing, I praise before I get the victory. I praise when I don't see it all coming together. Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Says this. Who shall go for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them. First means opening or commencement. Because there is an opening anointing on Judah. You see, when you get to the second level, things start opening up. Okay, You don't need a preacher or a pastor to come open it up. Your praise starts opening up. Your praise starts giving you new opportunities. Your praise starts bringing God's favor in on the situation. Your praise brings blessing in. Your praise starts to open because open means to, to be in position or permit passage. To move from a closed place to an open place. When you start to praise and you, get, you start getting passive. 
and you started getting red seas parting in front of you because that's what your praise does. You've got Pharaoh's army behind you and two mountains on the side of you and a red sea in front of you. And you stand back, look, and you just see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Hmm. You go before me and you make crooked ways straight. I'll praise you even if I don't see my way around this thing. And when you've got that kind of praise, then you've got an anointing that's been rubbed. Judah brings revelation. Revelation 5. Listen, the devil can't take my praise. The devil can't take my... Look at your neighbor say, the devil can't take my praise. Because I'm on another anointing. Another level of anointing. Revelation 5, verses 1 through 5 says, Thank you. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? Open the book and to, the loose, and, and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth Neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open that book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He said, stop weeping, because you've got a praiser. You've got a revelation, because when I start praising him, I start seeing things, because praise releases revelation. Revelation begins to illuminate, and when I start telling God, thank you, it is good. When he created the first day, he said, it is good. Then I reflect back on what he did, and I say, it is good that I praise when I get a praise. When I get a praise, I get pregnant. And when I get pregnant, I start producing. And when I produce, I can't help but to bring my praise to him again. So I thank God, and when I look back and I reflect, I say, it is good. There's a cycle of praise that brings me into the presence of the Lord God Almighty. If you ever let them shut you up, that they can't shut, then they can shut you down. But listen, the devil is a liar. It's time to open your mouth. It's time to open your mouth. Come on, church, open your mouth. It's time to open your mouth and praise him. There's a praise, there's a praise. There's a praise in this house right now. Father God, we just praise you. We praise you on the mountaintop. We praise you in the valley. We praise you, we praise you. It's all about our praise, our praise. Our praise will get us our breakthrough. Your praise is going to get you your breakthrough. Your praise is going to get you your breakthrough. Your praise is going to get you your breakthrough. And the final anointing is rub on. Okay? It's not just rubbed on. It's rubbed in. <laughs> There was a long war between the house of David and the house of Saul, which is the house of the spirit, the mind of the spirit and the mind of the flesh. But then it says in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3, the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and, the king, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed King David over Israel. So listen, <clears throat> all Israel rubbed this third anointing. And David took complete dominion over all things in this uniting, both Israel and Judah. 
Now this is where you receive the anointing that remains, which is in us, Christ, in us. Because what that literally means to be rubbed is to be imprinted. This is where you're really transformed into the image of God. Where you look like him, talk like him, act like him, create like him, so on. I don't know if you're ready. Okay? I don't know if you're ready. But there are some of you that have been being processed before knowing what's going on in your life. You, you didn't even know. Excuse me. You didn't even know. You, you were being processed and transformed and transitioned, and you didn't even know. Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He hath rubbed it into me. Okay? So this is my life. It can show that can show you mercy. My life shows you grace. My life shows you restoration. My life shows you his glory. My life shows you he's my provider. My life shows you that I'm an overcomer. My life shows you Christ and the life of Christ. Because only God, only God, only God, okay, it's rubbed in. Now here's the hard part. It's rubbed in by the pressing okay. and the pressure Ouch. Hmm. of God's hand. Yes. Yes. It's the place of maturity yes. where you've been pressed mm, Jesus. until oil runs out. Mm, yes. Now many can't handle this place. All right, yeah. Some fall. Oh, yeah. They fall wet. But listen, hmm. where you are determined to pursue him, regardless of how severe, that process of death is to yourself. Because what you get is this third level. When you get rubbed with the anointing, is you get a death certificate. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's no longer I that lives. But they but 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 they won't see me. They, they see Christ. That's right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now here we are. And the Bible talks about how many fall back and fall away because they can't handle that place. But Lord, I want your glory. Oh no, um, it ain't about a goose pump or a goose pimple. And I just want enough of that magical stuff that makes everything good in my life. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm willing to, to really go through what it takes, okay? It takes a crucifixion to get a resurrection. But if I can handle this process when I come forth, it's not I. It's not me any longer, but it's Christ, the one that lives in me. And so there's nothing that has rule over me. There's no rule. There's no fear. There's nothing that has rule over me anymore. There's nothing that can hold you back. 
You're not trying to get something because you are something. Listen to me, church. You are the church of Jesus Christ. Not routine, not religious. Wherever you go, you will bring forth the glory of God. You will walk as a living epistle, as the glory of God, as the child of God, as the hearer of God, and you will begin to change and bring change, ultimately to bring change. There is nothing too difficult. God has raised you up to be a world changer and a history maker. Light must go where there is darkness, and there's no distinction. God has called you to be to, to his glory, to his holiness in the earth today to be the salt, to be the light, and to bring forth the glory of God. You don't live one way in church and act another way at home. You are a child of the living God. You bring his glory because you are the glory. You are the image of the risen Christ. It's time for the church to arise, to awaken, to become the church, to come into your being. They are tired of false promises and hopes. Lead them helpless, 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 helpless. They want God. You can bring God because you've gone through something that you know that you know who he is. They want God. You know what he can do. You know where you are and where you came from. Then to bring forth the glory, you bring forth the light. For you bring forth the power. You bring forth the resurrection life. Because you are one with Christ. And now you glorify and magnify who he is on the earth. And there's no stopping you. You are, you are, you are. You are a child of the most high God. Look to your neighbor and say, I am a child of the most high God. I am a child of the most high God. I'm a daughter of glory. I'm a daughter of glory. I'm a daughter of glory. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here in a second. <laughs> Bring me to it, Lord. And then I have a word for you, okay? All right. The whole earth has been groaning for the sons and daughters to come forth. Yes. <laughs> to represent God in the earth. God wants to present himself through your life. Through Krista, Terry, Prophetess Jones, Cindy, Monica, Selena, Mary, Stacy, and you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yeah. Nothing's too difficult for God. Right. Nothing's too difficult for God. Nothing's too difficult for God. Sing it. Nothing's too difficult for God. Come on, Tina, say it. Nothing's too difficult for God. He's looking for somebody who doesn't want to play church, but who will be the church. Where you are, people, you... Listen, can I hear you? God, do whatever you got to do. I'm ready to be changed. God has released dominion. God has not given you a partial place. But God has not called you part way in, but he's calling you all the way in. For this is the generation that has been raised up to be a mighty army for the living God. This is the generation that will restore all things, bring back all things. You're walking in greater glory. You are greater glory. Arise, shine, come forth. Arise, shine, come forth. Arise, shine, come into your being. Come into your being. Stop holding back the process. Stop fighting it. Stop resisting it. Broken off you today is shame, condemnation, and guilt in the name of Jesus. You're not a product of the process. Come on. Broken off of you is shame and guilt. Yes, you had to go through what you went through. 
God was changing you and is. I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect, but God is. You're not a product of your process. You had to go what you had to go through. God was changing you from death to life. You've been called to go into greater into darkness. You've been called to be the light of God. You've been called for transformation. You've been called to bring the kingdom into the earth. You've been called to bring the royalty, the realm, and the rule of the spirit. You've been called as an extension of God. You've been called as an image bearer. You've been called as an agent on assignment to bring forth glory and to release his glory. You've been transformed to do the determination and the decree and the purpose of the living God. So, to sum this all up, there's a first level anointing. You learn to be trained and disciplined. Second level anointing, it's rubbed in. And you learn to praise under some pressure. Third level anointing, you die. And he lives. So everything that happened had to happen. Everything that had to be shaken had to be shaken. All right now. Things that left your life were not part of your destiny. Mm. I'm gonna say it again. Things that left your life are not part of your destiny. Amen. Stop trying to get back something that doesn't belong. Hallelujah. Huh? <laughs> now here's your word. Revelation 3, 7, 8. Mm. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth that no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set thee before thee an open door.